right? Five commissioners. And I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Donna, you ready? Yep, you're recording. Okay, great. So I'll call the meeting to order at 7.05. Um, and as usual, we'll start with a uh, uh, reading of the, the video conferencing rules that we like to follow in, um, in these meetings. So um, this is a web-based call. Um, we are operating under the following procedures. Um, the session is being audio, re audio recorded, just like every other planning and zoning commission meeting. Um, it is also being um, video recorded. Um, to ensure sound quality, the default rule for this meeting is that everyone will, will remain on mute. Um, to uh, the commissioners and staff will generally remain on mute except when speaking or voting and will generally be keeping video of themselves on throughout the meeting. Um, applicants and members of the public should feel free to leave their video on or off. However, when they're asked to speak, when it's their turn, um, they should please turn on their video um, if that option is available. Um, and if a video is not available, you will be um, you will not be precluded from speaking or providing public testimony. Um, but we do ask that you um, both state and spell your name at the beginning of your um, uh, comments and testimony. Um, and as during all public um, hearings, um, all of the normal rules, including stating and now spelling your name, still apply. And because this is a, a Zoom meeting, um, we ask that everybody try to be patient with each other, try not to talk over each other. Um, everybody will have a chance to, um, to get whatever they want off their chest. So with that said, um, I am going to um, the roll call. Um, and as I said, there are, so we've, got, um, we've got five members. Um, so um, I don't, I won't elevate anybody to voting status now um, unless um, other members join. And then I am going to jump right into the reading and approval of the minutes and item 3A, which is the, the approval of the regular meeting minutes of February 11, 2021. And if there are no comments, I would look for a motion to approve them as written. Motion made. Dale's trying to second. Second. <laughs> um, so if there's no further discussion, then all those in favor, so signify by raising your hand or saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, and then moving on to agenda item 3B, special meeting minutes of February 24, 2021. And hearing no discussion, I would ask for a motion to approve those minutes as written. So moved. Second. Great, thank you. Um, with no further discussion, and all those in favor, so signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, so is there anybody in the audience who has business before the commission who does not appear on the agenda tonight? Great, okay, so hearing none, then um, we will jump into old business and um, the first agenda item in all business is 5B1, uh, planning schedule for the rewrite of the subdivision regulations dated June 1, 1995. And um, nothing has changed from our, our previous discussions where we will um, continue to table this until such time as we can um, begin to meet in person. Um, so without, with no further discussion there, I will move on to agenda item, um, new business, agenda item 6A1. And can you make a is, motion to table that, please? Oh, sure. Um, can we make a motion to table um, agenda item 5B1? I make a motion. No, motion. Oh, whoever made it. S second. 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 All right, let's call that, let's call that Wes and, and then Adam. Um, okay, so then um, moving on to um, 6A1, um, which is our first public hearing, and I will um, 
uh, open the public hearing at um, 7.10 and I will read the legal notice. Um, okay, so Kent Planning and Zoning Commission, 41 Kent Green Boulevard, Post Office Box 678, Kent, Connecticut 06757, Town of Kent Planning and Zoning Commission, Notice of Public Hearing. The Town of Kent Planning and Zoning Commission shall hold a public hearing via Zoom meeting on Thursday, March 11th, 2021, beginning at 7 p.m. to discuss and possibly act on application numbers 09-21SP and 10-21C. Paul Zemanski, PE, Arthur Howland and Associates for Raphael and Courtney Posner. Um, 21 Oak Ridge Road, map 10, block 41, lot 19. Construction of a one bedroom detached dwelling unit pool house, driveway extension, deck, septic and associated site work. Any corresponding documentation will be attached to the official agenda. At this hearing, persons may participate and be heard. Please note written communications must be received by the land use office no earlier than 24 hours prior to the meeting. And the Zoom meeting number can be located on the official agenda that will be filed on the Town of Kent's website, a minimum of 24 hours prior to the official Zoom meeting. Matthew Winter, Chairman. Um, and with that, um, Donna, will you run us through the application? Sure. Um, uh, the property is located in, um, off of Richards Road um, in the uh, subdivision, the um, Iron Mountain subdivision. Uh, in the back corner, the house, it's the, the main house is set up, up on the hill. A couple of, well, actually it's gotta be at least nine years because I think it was Dan LaRoche. Um, they had come forward and they put a pool in front of the house. So that pool has been there for probably, I'm gonna say 10 years. Um, and what they want to do now is they want to put a, um, an accessory dwelling unit um, pool house um, in between the pool and the main house. Um, um, it, Ty and I did go up there. We, we took a drive by just to see where we thought this house was going to be going. It is, they do have, um, the regulations state that any accessory dwellings in, in front of the house need to be 100 feet from the road. They are. Um, and this is before you because it is an accessory dwelling unit in the rural district. It's going to have a full kitchen and, um, you know, it's going to have its own separate little drive way off of the main driveway that's existing currently right now. They have gone through wetlands. They've gotten their wetlands um, approval. And um, one of the requirements was when you put an accessory structure in front of the main house was some kind of screening. And there are maybe a half a dozen or so very large pine trees um, in front of the pool. I mean, we had to actually drive halfway up the driveway, maybe a third up the driveway before you could actually see the pool because there, and there's a little cutout area where they plow, they plow their snow and there's no tree there. Um, so you're not gonna see this from the road, I don't think. If the elevation is a little bit higher, you might see just the top of it, um, but um, that is it on my side. I know Paul would has more things to add to it. No, she did a great job. <laughs> and she's and tired. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me interrupt just quickly. Um, I will um, elevate David to voting status um, since he's here with us. Um, yeah. are, there, are there any questions? Uh, I guess I'll start with the, uh, with the commission members. Is there any questions from, from the commissioners for the applicant? Um, it's, it's not necessarily relevant, but how large is this part, the lot or the... Uh, It's five acres, according to the survey. Yep, five acres. Yeah. On I couldn't survey. see it. On the, okay, five acres. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yep. I assume it meets, you know, all the setbacks. It looks like it does. Seems like all right. the information is on the. Yep. On the plan. The driveway that's going in 
um, and that's close to the, the side, the left uh, set, setback. How, where are they going? Are they going in on the other side of all those pine trees? How far up the driveway will that new little driveway start? So they are going to go basically uh, between the right adjacent, directly adjacent to the patio uh, for the pool. So they will extend on that little, uh, there's a little parking area right now by the patio for the pool. And that's just going to extend along the pool. So the evergreens that are there, it sneaks between the evergreens and the patio. Okay, and you're not going to be having to take down any major trees or anything in order to put that driveway in? No, it's an existing landscaped area currently. It has shrubs, it's like a mulch bed. And Paul, you're going to move the pool fence, I assume, inside along the edge of the closer to the pool. Correct. Yep. We have health approval as well. You will have to take down a certain number of trees to put the, the building structure. In, yes. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Uh, south of the pool. And we're not in the horizon. No, not in there. Okay. Um, are there any questions or comments from the members of the public? I have a couple of questions. Um, as they relate to um, section 6200, is the um, I noticed that the that the addresses for the applicant are New Milford and Manhattan. Um, is the applicant um, um, a resident of the, the principal dwelling or they will they be a resident of this accessory? Yeah, line? the New Milford address is mine and I believe the Manhattan address is the architect's. APD workshop. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, and with the, the, the other question I have, I think was answered by Donna that they're, that um, because this is in the, what certainly I, I, I translate as the front yard, um, that it's allowed um, with approval by the commission by special permit, which this is, and it's visually screened from public view and adjoining properties by fences, walls, or evergreen plantings. And um, I think existing evergreens are, are um, a viable source of screening. So I think I understand that the, that the building will be screened sufficiently. Yeah, and the, the piece of property um, that, that to the left of, of the house um, is very wooded. Um, so the people who are to the left are really not gonna be able to see um, to see this structure at all. I mean, they'll, they'll be able to see it when the leaves are down, but for the most part, it is wooded, heavily wooded in that area. And there's certainly no nobody from the public who seems to be objecting. So it's, um, um, are there, I'd say I looked at the architectural plans, but I did not see, um, or I didn't, uh, recognize anyway, exterior lighting um, or exterior lights proposed? Uh, I don't see any proposed myself on the elevations. Um, if they are, they'd be a residential style fixture that's full cut off. We'd be happy to make that a, a condition. Certainly that's what we, we would uh, um, prefer. There's one sconce that appears uh, centrally located on the south and north uh, elevation. 
it's extremely difficult to see because it's it's a very narrow sconce. Okay. Um, yeah, minimizing the, uh, the 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 light leakages would be great. Understood. Hey, you're going to need some kind of light for building code approval, right? For um, you know, at the doors. That's where the two sconces are. They're at each door. Yep. And I also I also note that um, that we've got the, the the one application, but I don't I didn't see the site plan application. Donna, is that do 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 we have that? Yeah, we should. You mean it wasn't sent to you in the packet? I didn't see it in the packet. So the only the the, the only application under Paul's letterhead was the. Uh, um, sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Let me open it. I have the site plan application. It's it and it it is called site plan application. Yeah. You know, on the uh, I'm looking at it right on the Google. Drive. Drive, it looks like. Okay. I thought I only saw the special permit application, but that's fine. If you if you guys see it, that's great. If it's there, then then um, um, my my last question has to do with the waivers. Um, and before we close the public hearing, if that's where if that's what we're going for, we we should uh, um, uh, tighten up the the request for the waivers. I don't think that there really is any. I don't see any on the site plan application checklist. There's nothing marked as um, for the waivers. Right, and I think because everything that we ever require is there. They've got the water supply. They have a, there's no landscaping plan because I guess we could waive number six. We've got the architectural plan, the construction notes, the informational table. Traffic study we have to waive for special permits. Yeah. But everything else I think we have. So six in the tra uh, six. Which one? Yeah, what threw me is that there was there was no check marks on this uh, on, on on this list, so I, right. I didn't know what they were looking to, um, what they were looking to waive. To waive. They have pretty much everything else. So I would just say that we need to um, waive number six, which is the landscaping plan. Um, so Paul, can you make that representation? I didn't hear that, I apologize. Can, can Paul make that representation? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would form formally request a, a waiver of the landscaping and what was the other item? The traffic study. Oh, traffic study. Um, and then you can waive number 13 if you want to, which is the special permit constructed of more than 25 dwelling units, 50 parking spaces. Everything else is there. You've got stone walls, the architectural resources, scenic views and that kind of stuff. So you're all set with that. So I would just say add 13 to that. Yes, please. 
then I would look for a motion to accept the waivers, accept the request for waivers. So moved. Second. Great, thank you both. Um, all those in favor, so signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Um, okay, so just so just from my edification, um, can you tell me what the file name that is where I can find the uh, um, the site plan application? So it would say agenda item six a one, and then yeah. it should should just say um, site site plan app. Is it the one that says SP application? That's the special permit. Yeah, that's the special permit. Okay, that's that's what I'm trying to get at. I, I have the special permit and I can't find the other one. No, I would assume that we all have it in the same order if, if we're online. So it's site it's the SP application, then the site plan Posner, and then site plan app. So look at the site plan app. Because the site plan Posner is probably the actual site plan itself. It is. That's the actual site plan. Site plan app is the site plan application. Isn't that weird how one has it and one doesn't? I don't have it either. I, 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 I found it. Thank you. It's uh. I have it. 6A1 site plan. Site plan app. Okay, I see it. I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I it's not it's not named it's not named site plan exactly. <laughs> I got it's, it. Too. Uh, I got a. So got it's a the map. It's, it's the it's the second one. It's it's mm -hmm. it's it's the first one. It's the furthest one on the left on the mm -hmm. right. uh, on the second row. Right. Okay. So I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. I think that's the next step, Wes, yes. Second. Yep, I'll make that motion. Um, so I any said discussion? Before we move to close. Um, distance is allowed in the setback line the septic tanks or that's that's an allowed structure i wasn't i was flipping through things i just wanted to confirm yep they're um because they're underground so they're so underground. i don't really regulate those we make we look at those for wetlands purposes <clears throat> um okay, but because you. they're underground i don't regulate them and basically kathy is the one co kind of determines where they go based on um, perks and, and uh, deep chest holes. <clears throat> uh, okay, thank you. Um, so there's a motion on the table and a second. Is there any, any more discussion before we close the public hearing? Um, then without any, I would uh, call the vote. All those in favor, so signify by raising your hand or saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay. Um, so that's the public hearing. And um, does the commission have anything to say about the merits of the application? Um, then I would look for a motion um, on the application itself. You're on mute, Adam. But I think that sounded like a, a motion. That was. I said it. <laughs> Hold on, let me. Uh, I make. I make a motion that we accept applications number zero nine dash two one SP and ten dash two one C, Paul Zemanski, PE Arthur Howland, and associates for Raphael and Courtney Posner, 21 Oak Ridge Road, map 10, block 41, lot 19, construction of a one bedroom detached dwelling, unit, pool, house, driveway extension, septic and associated site work. Second. Great, thanks Adam, thanks Wes. Um, 
Any further discussion? Um, hearing none, all those in favor, so signify by raising your hand or saying aye. 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 Motion carries. All right. Thank you very Thanks, much everybody. for your time, everyone. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to uh, 6A2, um, which is another public hearing. Um, and I am going to pull up and read the legal notice. Um, Kent Planning and Zoning Commission, 41 Kent Green Boulevard, Post Office Box 678, Kent, Connecticut 06757. Town of Kent Planning and Zoning Commission Notice of Public Hearing. The Town of Kent Planning and Zoning Commission shall hold a public hearing via a Zoom meeting on Thursday, March 11, 2021, beginning at 7 p.m. to discuss the to discuss and possibly act on application numbers 11-21SP and 12-21C, David Booley, 16 Longview Road, Map 11, Block 40, Lot 49, conversion of existing barn garage into a two bedroom detached dwelling unit. Any corresponding documentation will be attached to the official agenda. At this hearing, persons may participate and be heard. Please note, written communications must be received by the land use office no earlier than 24 hours prior to the meeting. And the Zoom meeting number can be located on the official agenda that will be filed on the town of Kent's website a minimum of 24 hours prior to the official Zoom meeting. Matthew Winter, Chairman. Um, and with that, um, Donna, can I ask you to uh, bring us up to speed on this application? Sure. Um, <clears throat> um, this is, this was a very complicated, not a complicated, but a very um, complicated application only because um, when I was trying to compare what was trying to be done with what I had on record for everything, nothing matched. So we've been working on this for a while. Um, back in 2014, um, an application was pulled to install a two bedroom apartment in the existing 40 by 50 barn. Um, and Kathy had approved that um, back in 2014. And originally when Tim Sneller came in, he came in saying that um, there, there was gonna be kitchen facilities. And then he said, no, there wasn't gonna be kitchen facilities. Nobody was really clear what was done in the 40 by 50 barn. And what I, the, the site plan that I had on record actually showed the barn across the street. So I had across the driveway. So I had no idea <laughs> where anything was. And I, I actually have been to the property and I was still very confused. So um, David was great and he, um, he actually worked with me and, and was able to take pictures and explain to me that back in 2014, um, the only thing that they did do to the, bar the barn garage was to just put a deck on the back. Um, and so the zoning compliance for that deck, that second story deck, um, was approved back in um, 2016. So now Mr. Boulay, who is the owner of the property, would like to go ahead with the conversion of that second floor in the existing, and I'm going to call it a garage because for me, barn is where an animal lives and this is, is built to hold four cars. So I'm going to call it a garage. Um, wants to convert the second floor of that garage into a two bedroom um, guest house with a kitchen. So that is why he is before you now. Um, what I did um, was to ask him to please provide us with pictures and an explanation of all the different structures that are on the property because there is a detached garage, which is really storage because it's small. And um, so those are the, the new pictures that were added to the, um, the Google Docs, the, uh, the public meeting file um, yesterday morning. So if you want to take a look at those, you'll be able to understand, like I do now, where everything is. It is going to be my recommendation 
that at some point in time, a, an actual survey be done of the property? Because if you look, Dick Strid put the, the barn on the other side of the driveway. I turned that thing around so many times and I still couldn't figure out where anything was. So um, I, that would be my, one of my recommendations is that a survey be done of the property so that we have an accurate survey of what is there. Since this is a special permit, shouldn't we have that site plan? You know, I, I, mean, I, I, think, I, would... I, I think that I probably would have pushed for it if it was a, if, if the barn was going to be, the garage was going to be built, it was that if the garage was not pre-existing. But since the garage is already there, you're just converting what it, the existing structure that's there. And then he, I feel he can follow up with the site plan afterwards. He's not encroaching. The barn is, you know, the, the, the barn received everything it needed to, to in order to be built. Um, so it's just a conversion of an existing structure. But just to clean up the file and make sure that everybody is all on the same page, it, it's just a recommendation that I would like to see put in the file. So why is this a special permit then? Because he's making it an accessory dwelling unit, and accessory dwelling units are special permitted uses in the rural district. I think, right. It's hard to evaluate things like screening and stuff without a plan to look at. This is all in a vacuum, so it's very hard. Right. To really understand if it's an appropriate structure modification. Yeah, I mean, all the work that's going to be done is going to be internal. Going to be what? Done? Interior. It's going to be just interior, interior work. But we're really, it's where, it's where the applicant is really asking us to waive all of the requirements of the of the site plan. Yes. Application without really <laughs> asking. Right. You know, so we've we've got a couple of pictures and we've got a, a couple of pages of application. Um, you know, I, I don't know where this and property is. I don't know where, you know, I don't know what, what the, what the, the configuration of the buildings is on site. You know, I'm, I'm looking at these pictures and I can, I, I can sort of see, I, I went on Google, on Google maps and, and saw what the property looks like, but it shouldn't be my responsibility to, shouldn't be my responsibility to try to figure out what the applicant wants to do. He should be telling me. So that, that being said, um, I have a question for the commission. Um, and we, we ran through this with uh, um, when John Gleason put a dwelling unit above his garage on uh, Halls Lane um, in an existing building, an existing structure, right? So I wonder whether we should, as a commission, maybe change the language a little bit in 6200 um, Instead of instead of it being an internal, um, an internal dwelling unit, um, which is defined as a a dwelling unit that's within an existing dwelling, you know maybe it should be an internal dwelling unit created within an existing structure. Um, only because there's there's not too much for us to. There's not too much for us to look at. Um, it's an existing building. Um, it still has to come to us by a special. Well, no, in the in the in the very rural residential, that would be via zoning permit. So that, that it could be something that that we manage through the land use office. No, detached a detached dwelling unit with the kitchen would be a special permit. But it's, I guess what I'm suggesting is that this is a, it's a, it's an internal, it's, it's, if we, if we look at it as an internal dwelling unit within an existing structure, not necessarily within it, within an existing dwelling, um, then it doesn't have to be a special permit in the rural district. Okay. And just, just it, and it's just a, a, a zoning permit that, uh, that we manage in the office. I, I don't know whether that's a good idea or not, but we, we're, you know, we're not talking about, then we're not talking about screening because the building is already there. The structure is already there. Um, 
and we're not talking about setbacks or siting or, or any of those things. We're really just talking about creating something inside an existing structure. Right. Seems like it's a bit of a loophole. Could just yeah. burn and turn it. It sounds like a slippery <laughs> slope, Matt. It does. Yes, it does. <laughs> I mean, okay. I know what you're. I know what you're trying to say, but my gosh, look at all the barns all over the place. You could convert anything, anytime, anywhere into something—a dwelling space. Yeah, but it wouldn't be as of right. It would just be a zoning permit administratively through my office. Um. Well, you know, Alan, Alice, and Wes are right that we wouldn't have the opportunity as a commission to 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 view it, to review right. it. That's true. I don't know that we should give up that responsibility. I can't. I, do, I don't either. Why not? But um, I, I'm trying to think of an instance that that we would think about it differently, but uh, but it's too hard to do that. Okay, I, that that that's fine. It's it's just an idea. Um, and with so with that said, then I I don't think that I can I, I I can make any kind of a reasonable determination on this application without some more information, without some additional, you know, without a site plan. I agree with I that. Agree. Even if they they took an existing one and and marked it up, you know, um, took an existing survey, but it's very hard to tell where anything is or what what exactly is happening. Um, without that. Okay, so then I'll open it up to, uh, does, does the applicant want to say anything? Yeah, uh, this is David. Um, hi, David. hi, hello everyone. Um, so our purpose there is just, we have a very small house here, it's 16 or 1700 square feet. And um, I'm making a permanent residence here now because we, you know, as you know, I don't know if you know, but I'm in the restaurant business in New York City is going to, a turmoil. So basically, we were hoping to have uh, a couple bedrooms that family and friends could stay uh, when they come and visit. So if I need to, um, I need to know the path to get to the opportunity to have that, uh, you know, um, structure there so that we can have folks, family stay with us. Um, what exactly is the site plan that you need so I can understand clearer Um, what we would like um, certainly to start is a, is a plan of your property, um, which shows the structures on your property um, and where they are in relation to, um, in relation to each other and re in relation to the driveway and where the driveway comes off of the street, the road. Okay. All right. So is that an architectural um, uh, drawing or who, who puts that together? You should have. I have what Holland did for me years ago. He's done two studies here and how it fits into the property with the elevations and the lot lines and all of that, where the uh, structures sit. And when I think Don was talking about when Dick Strait built it, he made sure that he was within a certain number of feet from the, the neighboring uh, property. So I think that's clear in terms of what um, actually, it was Mr. Holland was the last time that we did something up here when he was still working. So um, you want to know exactly where these buildings sit on this property in location to each other? That's right. So it's, it sounds like what you're talking about from, from Howland would be, um, would be satisfactory for that piece. Okay. Because he stamped that, and I think that should be in, is that in town records? I don't have that in my records. Otherwise, I would have copied it and send it in. So what I have is um, the sanitary disposal system. Right, that Kathy. Uh, right. Right. And then I have something from 2004 that was prepared. And it seems like it maybe was the site plan. Um, but it's cut down. Um, and the only thing that is, is showing on this is the existing garage with the 40 by 50 foot barn across the driveway with an access road to it. All and right. I know yeah, I don't understand what that is, actually. It, 
exactly. So, um, so when I bought this house in 2003, the, uh, the little house there that you see, the storage house, that was where folk, those folks were putting their car and they would drive across. And I, I made that all lawn, all grass. So as a driveway comes directly off of uh, Longview, right up the hill, it just continues right to the face of the, of the garage. There's no other driveway. It's just one line right out to Longview Road. Right, and that's why I was so confused and asked you for all the pictures because I had been to the property, but because the existing structure was being referred to as a garage barn, what I saw was not a barn. What I saw was a garage. And so that totally threw me off after going through the file. And like I said, I don't have anything else in here. Um, I've got the subdivision plan, but that doesn't show the existing, anything existing on there. But that's why I had thought since the building was existing, you know, we could just do it with pictures and then follow up with the site plan. But the commission is requiring the site plan now. And maybe what, if what you have in your files could satisfy the, re, the requirement of the commission, then, you know, you could just get that to me and I can scan it in. Um, you know, I take a look at it first to make sure that it meets the requirements of the commission. Well, here's my question. When I bought the house in 03, uh, those fellers that had the house, they, you must have had a plan from them, right? The little house, the little garage, the 16 by 18 foot building, which I'm using for storage, and then the main house, which you see on the rocks there. Yeah, nope, I don't have any That's of that in it. the file. Wow, interesting. No, this I is well, I, you can't, this is your file. This is this is it. This is all okay. I have. <laughs> okay, oh. well, it's not like the file I have in New York, but right. Uh, right. So, uh, all right. So we need to. I'm surprised because you know I bought the house from those folks and everything looked like. I can't remember who the architects were. Bob Swain, I think. And then when Dick Street Strid got the approval to put the garage or barn, didn't he have to file that with you folks? Yeah, but the picture that he put, like I said, that what he supplied was an access road and, and the barn across the driveway and not on the same side where it's built now. Oh, so maybe what he was looking at was when that little house had a dirt driveway that came to it, which I have all lawn there now for about 12 or 15 years. Uh, actually, once we built the four bay garage, that became grass, so there is no other driveway. So the four bays, the entrance of that is directly connected down the hill to Longview. So there right. is, it's, it's very simple. It's just a little garage, uh, which is now a storage van, the original house, and then the barn where Dick built it. Right. So what, what, I, what I would suggest is um, Donna, um, you and David work out getting the site plan that we think we need um, from however um, David can get it um, and we can um, review it as a commission. Um, and then um, if you wouldn't mind speaking with David about the, uh, about this, the, the items required for that's the special permit um, for which we would likely be willing to um, uh, agree to waivers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can get together um, at our next meeting. So just just so you understand, David, this uh, we, I, 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 what what you're what you're hoping to do is is absolutely permitted by the um, by the regulations, and we just have to follow some protocol um, to treat everybody equally. So we review the, review these applications. Um, we apply the same uh, strategy to all of them. I understand. Um, Okay. And I, when I went with Kathy over in uh, Torrington, you know, she came out a couple of times. Joe Gobble did all the work and set it up for the sanitation to have two bedrooms. And that's where the confusion got lost because uh, I wasn't spending a lot of time here since those times because I was always in New York. But now that I've been here for a year, I'm trying to get it caught up and understand exactly what's been filed, what's been done, where, where are we, what can I do? And, you know, I'd like to have a place where people could stay over. So when they uh, eat my food and have a few glasses of wine, I'll have to send them off on the road wondering if they're going to get home or not. So, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the goal. And uh, I reached out to Donna because I want to know, you know, what's been done? Um, where are we? Uh, Kathy told me that she had approved it, um, you know, years ago. So there was some confusion about 
what's the protocol the, after Kathy does it, you know, who it had to go to and was that done? And that's what I'm trying to get caught up on now. So to, to clarify a little bit more, this uh, site plan will demonstrate uh, what exactly, just so I understand 100%, it's just the location where the buildings are within the perimeters of the property? Yes. Okay. And the, the property lines where the driveway comes off the road, um, the, it's the, Donna will be able to explain all of that to you. It's really, it's really it's a, a survey that, that, that you should have or the, the, the town should have in their land records um, or in the, it's in the, the uh, Donna's telling us we don't have it in the land records, but it may be in the, in the deeds um, in the clerk's office. Um, okay. So I'll put that Howard, I got a couple copies that Howard did for me. I'll put that in the, can I put that in the red box down and down in front of the? Yeah, know? that'd be fine. Okay. Yep. And, and that shows where everything is on it. Okay, I'll look to see what, you know, what's on there and, and then we'll go from there. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Thank all of you. Thanks, David. So I would look for a motion to continue the public hearing until our next meeting. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Um, any more discussion? All those in favor, so signify by raising your hand or saying aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, then let's move on to agenda item 6B1, um, which is uh, Paul Zemanski, Arthur H. Howland, LLC, proposed changes to section uh, 3124, creation of section 6700, um, village residential one and village residential two, con conservation development standards. Um, so we've talked about this over the last the, the last couple of months, and I think we're close. Um, but why don't uh, um, Donna, if you want to say a few words, um, go ahead, and then we'll turn it over to Paul and see what he has to tell us. Um, and I think Paul can go ahead and shoot for it. Alrighty then. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, since the last meeting, uh, I took uh, Mr. Chalder's direction from the last meeting, uh, and basically took a large amount of the uh, text regulation that I had previously uh, borrowed from the commission that they had eloquently written in the RU1 zone. And I basically added it to section 3124, section 10, which would be a new section under 3124 as Glenn suggested. Um, that provides uh, some general information and then adding uh, to the standard section uh, section 6700, uh, the actual performance standards that we had discussed in detail uh, starting two or three months ago. Um, so basically, I took his direction and incorporated the, the majority of the uh, text that we previously discussed into the two locations he suggested, um, as opposed to modifying the subdivision regulations uh, and the zoning regulations. Are there any questions from the commissioners for Paul? So yeah, hi, hi Paul. Oh, sorry. Hi, Drew. I was just gonna ask, you know, it sounded like a very nice, neat, simple way of, of being consistent with our regulations to do it this way. Did you detect any problems once you actually went and did it in, in terms of formatting it this way and setting it up or did it seem yeah, like- Yeah, actually I did. Um, I initially put everything just in section 3124, section 10. Um, and it, it didn't, it w I didn't believe it was consistent. So we added that performance standards section, which Glenn had said would be acceptable at the last meeting. And once we did that, it's entirely consistent because the section 6,000 series has like day camp standards and other performance standards. So it totally flows with your existing formatting that you have. Great, thank you for doing that and for the yep. confirmation. Yep. And you modeled um, the proposed 6701 um, on, the, on some of the text in the existing 5200, right, Paul? 
which That's is the correct. The RU one is conservation overlay. Yep. Um, with regard to the to the the added section ten and thirty one twenty four, Paul, um, in the previous versions we had talked about. Um, the calculation of the number of lots being based on um, a minimum lot size of 10,000 in the, in the VR1 and 30,000 in the VR2. But in this version, it's, it's half of that. Can you remind me um, how we landed there? Number of lots shall be calculated by. I'm just looking through my last uh, iteration prior to this. Bear with me for one second. Hey, Wes, if you're speaking or George, one, one, I'm having a hard time hearing you unless uh, that's just background. Okay, maybe background. So the, <clears throat> I have a couple of handwritten notes. The existing, uh, the existing uh, lot size that's allowed as of right in the VR1 zone is 10,000 square feet. Um, so there would be no density benefit to provide the additional open space beyond that, which would typically be required if it was at 10,000 square feet, and this is a thousand square feet more than the density in 3124 section eight for multiple dwellings, uh, that has a density of 4,000 square feet uh, per, per unit. So it's higher than the multiple dwelling, but it's lower than the as of right. And I, I remember that I remember that conversation um, with regard to the minimum lot size for multiple dwellings. Um, so in the in the VR two, fifteen thousand square feet. It's currently thirty thousand is allowed as of right. That's right. So fifteen thousand is it? It seems. It seems pretty dense to me, right? So you're talking about five lots, you know, roughly five lots an acre, right? Uh, about no, three, right. three, three lots, 15 three would be. Right. Slightly less than three. 43,560 is an acre. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Numbers is my business. Does uh do any of the commissioners have any 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 sense of of whether it's three lots an acre for its, uh, its conservation for to calculate the number of lots on a conservation subdivision is is excessive or or, or reasonable? And remember, it's further reduced by uh, you have to do multiply it by eighty five percent. So yeah. So explain to me how many houses <laughs> will you have on a lot without doing the math, without making me do the math? So I ran it uh, in a scenario of, I think it was a 12 or 13 acre lot. In essence, it would allow a similar number of lots than allowed as of right, but 40% of the property is preserved as open space. So if you said, you know, let's just say it's 13 acres because it's probably um, probably makes sense. So 13 acres, you're, you're talking about um, roughly 39 lots, less 15 percent. So it's 33, 34 and really Somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, 34 versus 13, 26. So it's, 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 
uh, 28 maybe. So you got, you know, just, and in really rough numbers and on a, on a 13. But then you have an open space requirement in the conventional. So that would further change it. Yeah. It's somewhat, you're right. It somewhat limits where you can place those lots and leave them yeah. open. Um, but if we're, if we're talking very specifically, just so the commission can picture what that looks like, the lot that we're talking about, I mean, I know we're not, we're not spot zoning, but, but the, it's the lot at the top of the hill where, where it starts to flatten out across the street from Casey's property. Um, that's about 13 acres. Um, and you can't see it all from, from the road, but uh, um, you're talking about 30 something houses on that piece of property. Does that sound too dense? I mean, just as yes. an example. <laughs> it sounds, sounds pretty dense. dense to me for the town the, of Cat. Just, just to be clear, the, the intent is it, it is not that number, the way the regulation is written, because you have to provide a 40% set aside of open space. So in essence, before the calculation is really done, you're reducing that lot size by 40%. So it's the unencumbered area, so to speak. So, so, the, 40 so if you're, the 40 percent of 13 acres or 40 percent of each individual lot i'm no, sorry of the thir let's use matt's example the 13 acres so of 13 acres uh 7.8 acres would remain unencumbered so then you would divide that by the 15,000 square feet is that how you would do it, Paul? You wouldn't do it the first the one way and then and then try to fit as many as as many houses as you could onto, you know, within the within the the total number of, of houses, lots that you could have. Um, figure out, figure you get 32, you know, let's use that number. Figure you get 32, um, wouldn't you try to fit as many lots on the 60%? You couldn't because the you wouldn't be able to meet the minimum lot area because forty percent of the property can't be used as the lot area. So you would do the you you would take sixty percent first and then and then do your calculations. Correct. And that would be the intent of the regulation. That's correct, and that's how I believe the existing regulation is written as well for the RU one zone. But so Paul, in this example that we used with that thirteen acres where seven of it would, would have to be, couldn't be built on, how many houses could potentially go on to that 13 acres? Uh, in, in the way that we've laid it out hypothetically, there's yeah. only thir thir 13 or 14, so. Yeah, I, I, that, and that, that sounds about right. If you, it's, it's, I, yeah. I wasn't sure that you were doing that, that, that the intent was to take the 60% first. Um, Correct, yes it is. Okay. Is that a third, that's not a third, so that, that's the way it's laid out now. And Matt, you said you came up with a number of 32 houses versus how many we could actually be on, a, on, a not, on another hypothetical lot with the same math? Um, yeah, I came up with, and, and, and again, these are really rough numbers. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly, it's, I'm, in, I'm, a, I'm in construction. I'm not an engineer. Um, so math, is, I, I, my math is, uh, is rounding. Um, but I, I, I would have compared 26 or so to 32 or so um, based on taking the whole of the lot. Um, but with Paul's, with, with Paul's clarification, um, my math doesn't work anymore. So Paul's 13 houses, right? What's 13, 14, something like that. 13 yeah. and 14 is more, is more reasonable. <clears throat> and remember, it's the, um, this is a special permit process, the way it's set up. So it's the highest discretionary level uh, of the commission in their decision-making process. Since we've been talking about site plans, is there such a thing? For this, it's it's similar, Alice. It's uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a subdivision application which yeah. we haven't had in forever. Right. So we would have that, right? 
-hmm. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You would need okay. both. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, like no, no. The, the way this application we just process ran into would an example work. of no site plan. <laughs> yes. Oh, no, no. So yeah. just so everyone understands, because a lot of people may never even seen a subdivision application because they don't yeah. happen anymore, really. Right. Yeah. Um, a typical subdivision application includes a, a very detailed existing condition yeah. survey, which shows tree line, mature trees, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. two foot existing topography. It shows the existing roadway that it will come off of. The proposed yeah. plans will typically show a sight line analysis of the new road intersecting with the existing road. It mm -hmm. will show the proposed grading for any roadway. It will show mm -hmm. the drainage associated with that roadway. Mm -hmm. It will show associated construction details. It will show drainage calculations. It will show proposed hypothetical grading for each lot, each lot demonstrating that it's meeting the standards. Mm -hmm. It would also have to show its water supply. It would have to show that it's served by public sewer uh, with this particular uh, regulation with associated details and approval from the Water Pollution Control Authority. Um, you would have a sedimentation and erosion control plan uh, as part of this. And then you would have an examination of the primary and secondary conservation areas and the open space analysis presentation, um, how fire protection uh, is provided. Uh, so it's different than your typical uh, guest house mm -hmm. application. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, then My the lesson code for a 15 acre lot would be 25 houses. In theory, you could fit in if someone was, someone was so inclined to do so. Well, the commission would have the discretion to say they felt that was too dense based on that particular lot and deny the application. Yeah, because there has to be some flexibility, right? There's multiple properties that would be applicable here. Some are visible from the street. Some are not visible from the street. There's topographic constraints that could limit density. There's things such as ledge that could limit uh, development density. There could be sensitive resources like wetlands on a property and soils that aren't well drained. So it would be more difficult to handle the impervious surfaces from the roadways and the roofs of the structures and the driveways. So that might necessitate a less dense development as opposed to something that's more of a bank run gravel with extremely well drained soils and little to no ledge. Um, no, so when we're thinking just, about things just, like this, to, sorry, I didn't hear you, David. I apologize. Yeah, I did, when something is too dense, it becomes a very subjective judgment. It just I wasn't clear if density is a uh, like a specific thing we can point to. If a litigious developer were to show up and say, "Well, regulations, it's not too dense." I'm not an attorney, so Donna would have to refer that to the attorney as maybe part of the public <laughs> hearing discussion. I could play one, but it would be of, of no value to you. <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask Paul, you know, from an engineer's perspective, it almost sounds like you're saying that the way this is set up um, gives us sort of the ultimate amount of flexibility in, in terms of controlling the development um, and, and perhaps almost seems a little onerous to, to a developer. I mean, it, it seems to be weighted in our favor, uh, if anything, in, in terms of being able to guide the final number of homes developed even outside of the calculations or constraining the calculations a little bit. Yeah, I mean, similar to the way that the RU1 is currently set up as well, the overlay zone. Hey, Wes, I thought that I heard you start to, to chime in, um, and I will just uh, hope that you do if you have anything to say. Great. Does anybody else on the commission have, have uh, any, any comments, or um, should we move to, um, to close this discussion and um, begin to schedule the public hearing? Can I just offer one quick thing if no one has anything else? Uh, one major oversight that we didn't bring up when we're doing these lot calculations is the public right of way would not be part of the lot area as well. So we didn't discount it by that as well. 
it, it's the, the subdivision doesn't necessarily have to have a public right of way, right? It could be a it could be a, a private road built to as as much as possible to the standards. I think that's the way it's written, right? As much as possible to the standards. Uh, it is, but you would have a common uh, association owned right of way that wouldn't be part of the minimum lot area. So, so say someone wanted to apply for this not as a conventional subdivision, but a uh, you know something else. That it would be a private road in essence, and that would be an association owned piece of property, the road and the shoulders. So that would not be able to count towards the minimum lot area either. Okay, great. Um, Donna, what's the process for the, do we, do we, do we have to, do we have to move to, to close 6B1? No, you don't need to move to close, close 6B1. You can just move on to 6B2, which is the scheduling of the public hearing. Um, and the way that this would work is, um, the meeting date would have to be May 13th, um, because I need to be able to publish it in the newspaper before, um, I have to publish it in the newspaper on April 30th and May 7th. It has to be to the town clerk by um, May 3rd. It has to be to the COG, Hustonic Valley elected officials and the neighboring town clerks by April 7th. And then that would allow me to be able to do a 513 meeting, um, at which point in time it would be published in the newspaper probably on the 15th. The adoption date would be 5-31-21, and then they wouldn't be able to come for the special permit app um, until June 10th. Oof. Now, uh, you know, instead of, this is gonna be my recommendation because we have a couple of other public hearings that, that refer to regulation changes that maybe we would consider doing a special permit and kind of moving, not a special permit, a special meeting just to talk about the change to the regulations. And then I can figure that all out and see if we can't, you know, if, if it goes to the, I would have to redo all the dates again, but I think we could probably set it up so that um, they wouldn't have to wait until June to file the special permit. Um, not, none of them will have to. That would be extremely appreciated. I, I think that's why I, I think um, we should schedule it as, as, as soon as we can, Donna, um, okay. and then we can all agree to meet. I, th I think it's, I think it would be beneficial to have these, um, these discussions outside of our, our regular meetings only because they, they, they have been um, somewhat tedious. Okay. That's the wrong word. They've been long lately. Yeah, they have. Um, so then I think that that's a, uh, that is, we've we've moved on from six B one to six B two, and we're we're ready for a motion. I think to have Donna um, work on scheduling the the public hearing. So I'll make that motion. Adam, I'm sorry, we missed the second half of that. I'll make the motion. I'll make the motion for Donna to to oh. start working on making a public hearing it uh i don't know why it went back on mute sorry <laughs> that's all right second great thank you both um any more discussion then all those in favor so signify by raising your hand or saying aye okay that's uh motion carries um i saw thank you for your time everyone sure thing paul Thanks, Paul. Have a great I'll, let you, I'll let you know the dates and, and the timing and all that kind of stuff. Greatly appreciated. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks, you great. too. Um, and then, uh, okay, so uh, moving on to 6B3, um, scheduling of the public hearing for proposed change to zoning regulations, addition of private burial ground as special permitted use under section 3224. Rural residential district and inclusion of a private burial ground under section 2200 definitions. Um, so I'm not going to say again that I didn't see the proposed regulations, the proposed change. Um, it was in your packet from the previous month. I didn't resend it. Okay, fine. Um, and I know that it, it kind of caught everybody off guard. At least I, I looked that way for Mark. 
Um, but we've, I'll just kind of recap. We've had a, um, a couple of calls in the past month um, about the possibility of, of creating a private burial ground on properties. Um, and we have cemeteries as a special permitted use in the rural district. Um, and according, we, we have no definition of cemetery in our regulations, but according to the illustrated book of development definitions, a cemetery is defined as property used for the interment of the dead. So um, I, I did speak with um, Matthew Pollock, who is with um, the, uh, he is with the state health department um, and um, they are actually the ones that would give the final approval of any kind of private burial ground. Um, he said in, in the last 20 years that, that this has been under his purview, they've only had maybe three or four. So I started doing some searching. Um, the, um, the only one that had an actual regulation regarding this was Sherman. So the regulation that I had put together is based on Sherman's regulation, which was based on state statute under which they need to apply as well. Um, I did today, I talked to, because I, I couldn't find any other towns. Um, I did talk to New Milford this morning and they sent me some information. They actually um, do have one private burial ground that came before them about six or seven years ago. They don't have a particular title called private burial ground, um, but their cemeteries are also special permitted uses. Um, and so this private burial ground, they allowed them to come before the commission under the special permit purview where they were able to condition it and set it up the way that they wanted to. Um, so now that kind of, I know I had asked Mike, Mike was saying that he didn't think that, um, that a private burial ground, he, he felt that you would need to have it listed because it, there's no listing for that as an accessory use. Um, but if you go back in history, it definitely was. And, and on these large pieces of property years and years and years ago, um, people buried their, their families on their own property. So with that being said, I'm now throwing out two different options. You can either accept the private burial ground addition to the regulation, or you can allow these people to apply under the special permitting process um, under cemetery and set your conditions of approval um, being lot size, um, you know, and then tying it into the requirements of the state with regard to easements and where they, where they say things can be placed. Um, Sharon, at one point in time, did allow a private burial with a condition that um, it was a divorce proceeding and they actually hated each other. And the husband said, I'm burying, I'm gonna, when I die, I wanna get buried on this property. And so he died, but the condition was once the house is sold, you, your body's gotta be moved. So he died, he got buried. Two days later, she sold the property and then he had to get moved. Um, so the joke was on him actually, but um, Sharon does not allow it any longer. So there's a couple of different ways that, that you can handle it. And, and I guess, you know, at this point I would need um, some guidance as to which way you want to pursue this. If it's, if it's a special permit, mm -hmm. then the burial ground goes with the land forever, correct? That's correct. Unless you condition it that if the property is ever sold, then those interred there would need to be moved. I mean, that's Whoa. a condition that you can put on the, on the approval. You can put a condition on the approval that the property has to be a certain number of acres, you know, depending on where it's located. The, the one um, in New Milford just happened to be on an already large piece of property with the current 
owner owning adjoining property and property across the street. So um, as the minutes, I should have asked Paul because he was the one who brought it forward um, to New Milford. Uh, the minutes had stated that basically, um, you know, allowing a cemetery to go in is, is less impactful than putting in another house or two. Um, so I just, I just need to know from you which way um, you would like to move forward with this. Can a private cemetery be a huge cemetery that a private company owns? No. I mean, so it's really just a small, ideally small uh, burial ground for a family, an extended family, or something along those lines. Right. And what happens is when they apply to the state, they need to provide a site plan that actually determines at that point in time how many people would be interred on the property. So, and that's what they would need to stay with. And that would be, you know, we would have to see that approval first and then that's how you would condition it. It could be one, pe one person, you know, it could be, you know, a family of 10. It could be just blood relatives or it could be um, blood relatives or relatives um, related through marriage, you know, that kind of thing. So one, concern I would have if we allowed this to happen um, and if somebody would remain buried there after a sale of a property well nobody's there to look after if you can say that um, the person who's buried there so somebody may decide well, I'm just digging that guy up he's in my way of my pool or no. she you know, I'm sorry, I mean, it's, okay. it's ridiculous, but really, I mean, if you think about it, there'd be, there'd be no way to, there's no way to, to stop somebody from doing that. No, um, actually, they also have to put an easement on the land records that, that defines um, the location of this private burial area um, and, and, and access to it and what they can and cannot do with it. An easement so, to who? And the, 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 pe the people who, who own the, the easement. I'm sorry? Who gets the easement? When you ease a property, like if, if I had a bunch of land, I could ease it to the Kent Land Trust or to some right. other land trust or whatever. And then right. their job is to, it, it, part of their job is to oversee how that property is used and make sure that that it that it isn't used in a way that it's not allowed by the easement. So who are you easing these small little burial, burial lots to who are going to watch the, that property and make sure these things don't happen? I'm just, what organization is it? I'd like to know those things before we go and allow people to get buried all over our town in everybody's backyard. Well, I mean, you would, it wouldn't be like that because you, you, it would be a special permit and the requirement would be a certain number of acres. The easement is for access to it, the privacy of it. Um, and it's an easement that you as the landowner place on your own property for st strictly for the burial of the family members. Um, and that is, and before the state will approve that, they have to see that easement and that easement has to be on record. What it's happened? not necessarily an easement to somebody though, Adam. It's, it's you, you can have an easement that's a, that's a public right of way, right? You can you can ease your property for a public right of way from mm -hmm. Route 7 down to the, the down to the river. So that doesn't alleviate what my concern was. Because when when Jack and Helen are buried right over there where it would be a great place for my pool. Who's going to stop me from digging them up and putting them somewhere else? Well, Donna think, would, right? Well, I would think that, well, yeah, no. Um, I would think that the state would, would be the one that would be regulating what happens to the remains after, after the property is, um, is, could possibly be sold. Or, you know, I mean, it would have, you would have to say, 
in the easement on the land records that in the in the case of the property being sold, Ty is hysterical laughing at this. We had this this whole big conversation about this, and it's really it's it's serious. But um, you would put in your in the easement would say you know in the case of the property being sold, you know. Um, Uncle Tom and, and Aunt Kathy will need to be removed. And, and the person who's buying that piece of property would understand that that is something that's gonna happen or that they're gonna stay there in perpetuity. But anything- it's, it's Then right, we're forcing and, people to, to dig up, you know, their ancestors from who knows when and find some other place to intern them. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't think that that's a concern of the commission. You know, I mean, it's it's as if as you know, I mean, it's it's my property, right? And and I, I would like to bury my family on there. Um, yes, it might affect the, the value of the property, but that's not a concern of the commission. Depending on what the easement says, would dictate what happens to whoever's on there, and the person who's buying it would have to do their due diligence and look at the deed and look what's filed on the land records and then check with the state. It's definitely something that you're gonna to have to take into consideration, you know, as the buyer of that property, but you're gonna be gone long anyway. So. I still wanna know who's responsible for it after it's sold, if somebody's gonna stay there and not be dug up. So we've got two choices then. We've got, uh, we, we can say, you know, right now, right now a cemetery is, is, is permitted, right? So we could just leave it as it is and have the, and have somebody who wants to have a, a, you know, a quote unquote private burial ground. They can come in and apply for, for a cemetery. And, and the cemetery requires, you know, there's certain requirements for a cemetery and they would have to come to us as a special permit. We could ask all of those questions and, 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 and decide what that easement would be. Or we could change the regulation and then also by special permit allow um, a new designation, which is called a, 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 a private burial ground, which is, you know, smaller and not public. And um, could we there's, get a, there's a cemetery. So I was just going to suggest, can we like ask a lawyer who understands the laws in Connecticut with respect to burying people in cemeteries for some advice on what we may get ourselves into, because it seems like we have a single word in the entire zone of regulation and everything else we would be creating from whole cloth and a special permit application, which just seems fraught. No. And if, if it's a cemetery as opposed to private burial, does that mean anybody and everybody could, they could sell a lot, so they could sell spaces? No, sure. but if you're gonna make it a private burial ground, then it's stated that there aren't that the lots cannot be sold. But if, if it's you, a cemetery, if you it's a cemetery, can. it would be a condition of approval. Okay. Where, where, just where was that stated? You know, at the right proposed regulations, not the current regulations. We don't have yeah, anything in the current we don't regulations have other than it's just a special use cemetery. Yeah, I know we have the one word special permit. Right. Okay. Cemetery and no, and no, no definition either. Yeah, because I mean, one could say, hey, it's a, my private burial ground is a cemetery. I still don't know what that means. I, there's a whole Connecticut section on regulation of this stuff in the state law. This, but maybe yeah, are you not. looking at, what is it? Section 19, section 19 A, 313? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's the um, environmental engineering mausoleum crematory private burial grounds. So it says there's no legal definition of a private burial ground, but it is assumed that it would be for people associated with the families and that the lots would not be sold. Under Connecticut state law, a burial permit must be obtained from the town clerk or any other person who was authorized to issue those burial permits. Right, but once somebody's buried, there's other laws about what can happen with the body, right? I think that addresses some of Adam's questions and making sure it's on the land record because if the lot that like, goes into probate or something that that stuff would follow the land around until it's dealt with for example 
Yeah, I think that the the the, the easement is a is a is a the easement is a legal document. So anything anything that happens on the piece of property, as, as David's saying, that's um, that that's what that once you have this permission, once it's on the land record, then then that that parcel is you, you can't do anything with it. You know, so and if you want to put a pool in, if you want to build a shed, if you want to put any structure up per our regulations, you have to at least go and talk to the to the, the planning and zoning. You have to at least go to the land use office. And no, you can't do anything without without at least getting um, um, uh, approval from Donna and Ty. It seems like the law might allow you to disinter the bodies, move them to another cemetery, and then you could end the easement. But that would that that would that would again that the ending of the, the, the easement is a, is a legal thing that would have to it would have to it would have to be on the land record. Um, so I, I I know we're 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 talking about this again. Um, I, I am I'm not um, uh, not sure that I'm in favor of a private burial ground. You know, so I'm I'm, I'm not really even sure that that I'm you know, willing to go down the road of talking too much more about it. And then that's just me, you know, I, I, I don't see the need. Would we um, want to just wait for somebody to come ask for it? Well, that's what drive, that's what's driving this conversation. But was it like a serious ask? Or was it, hey, what about, do you have any issues with this kind of ask? No, this was a serious ask. Okay. I mean, like I said, if you would like, you know, instead of changing the regulations, have them come in under cemetery like like uh, New Milford did, and condition it on on what state requirement is. You can condition it however you like. I mean, there at that point in time, there wouldn't be any anything to hold you back. I mean, you could say, you know what, this is only for one person. I think that's what I would prefer because then, you know, as as David said, I think we're going to want some we're we're going to want some legal advice as to as to um, at least somebody to look at at what we're going to be approving the conditions for approval, um, and and we we can we can satisfy the the legal requirement by asking those questions when it's actually necessary. It's, it's you know I don't not to be callous, but when it's necessary. And I'd like to know there must be some rules or laws about how somebody's buried i mean if somebody just said look i want to a whole dog i want to be dumped in there i want the worms to eat me up no Is no that... no no that you can't do i mean you can't you can't but that's what i'm saying i, I want to know what those rules and laws are that that govern how how somebody gets interned well, the, the Connecticut General Statutes 19A-313. And 7-64. Really <laughs> reading. You know, I mean, you can't you can't just arbitrarily decide, oh, you know what? You know, I'm gonna you have to you have to they have to be interred by, by they would have to be interred by a funeral home. And that funeral home needs has certain criteria and legal responsibilities that they need to abide by. You know, I mean, and there's also the possibility that maybe this person is not actually going to be put in the ground, but maybe this person is going to be put in a mausoleum and that's going to sit above the ground and not in it. So, you know, that's going to be, or it could be a very small area where somebody's ashes are going to be placed. So I don't think that, like, I don't think that it's, it, it gets done in a vacuum. There are certain requirements that need to be followed by the State Department of Health. Um, and, and that would need to be, um, need to be obtained before. So it would be my recommendation that, uh, that we not put forward um, a new regulation um, and we chase this down with our current regulations. Um, and then if we have to make any adjustments after the fact, um, as we go through this, I, 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 and I don't mean to say after the fact that we're, like we're kicking the can down the road, but I think I think that we've got the the provisions in place in our current regulations to to really limit or or to regulate this type of activity. I do so too. That, that, that's what I would suggest. To 
so then what I would do is advise um, the person who is strongly interested in this to file a special permit. Out for I the think next that's meeting. right. Okay. Yeah. So we're not. So we're not spinning our wheels with 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 something that's that's you know we've got something concrete to seek our teeth into, and then we can uh, um, we can talk to our um, land use attorney if 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 that's what we decide that we want to do, and we can we can really go through the special permit process and ask all of these questions and satisfy Adam's curiosity about um, what happens at the end of the day um, when you know when Nana has to get moved to some other spot. Okay, so to move this along, very nice. <laughs> come back and haunt you for a long time. <laughs> um, I would look for a motion then to uh, um, um, that we not schedule a public hearing for the uh, for the private burial ground for the zoning regulation change. So the, we're gonna make a motion to not do that, or we're gonna make make a motion to continue this. We're going to well, make, make a motion to not act on, on this. Do um, not act on it. I'll we're make not going to act on this and we're going to wait until somebody actually comes, comes with a request. I make that motion that we will not out, act on this now and we'll wait until there's a real application in front of us to deal with it. Second. Okay. Thank you both. Um, any more discussion? All those in favor, so signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, and now, um, 6B4, scheduling of a public hearing for the proposed change to the zoning regulation, changes to section 4124.26 in the Village Commercial District. And this is the, uh, this is the, the, the modification that we talked about um, with Glenn at our last meeting. Um, and I think we're ready to schedule this public hearing. Um, does anybody have any questions about the text or the language of the, uh, of the proposed change? Then I think I would look for a motion um, just as we did um, for the uh, scheduling of the public hearing um, in 6B2 that Donna make arrangements to schedule the public hearing um, um, as quickly as she can in conjunction with uh, with the public hearing for the regulation change in 6B2. I make that motion. And I second it. Wonderful. Any discussion? All those in favor, so signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Great, motion carries. Um, and then, uh, we are now at 6B5, which is the uh, proposal by Gina Olson, owner of Chestnut Woodworking and Antique Flooring Company and Tarot and Time for outdoor shopping and monthly music events, 31 North Main Street, map 19, block 14, lot one. Um, and I think you know, we, we talked about this at the last couple of meetings. Um, thank you, Gina. Um, and I think that we were at the point at our last meeting where we were considering relaxing um, section 4131.4 um, to allow for display of, of, uh, of merchandise, I think, um, uh, outside of the three foot distance off of the building. Um, than is currently allowed by the regulation. Um, and Donna, I believe is correct from her comment last week, last month, that the building is in fact the port, the porch is part of the building. Um, I was making somewhat of a, well, it's the argument was weak, um, that it was at the edge of the, at the outside wall, but um, Donna's right, that it's the, at the edge of the porch. And right now we allow, um, display of that, that merchandise immediately adjacent to the building, um, extending no more than three feet out. Um, so with that, I would look for any, any points of discussion or Gina, if you want to, if you have anything to say, maybe you start or you can tell us that we have all the information that we have that we need from you. Well, it's kind of good that I'm following the burial um, request because mine, I'm just asking for a table. So, 
No, it's, it's pretty easy. I was just hoping maybe to be able to use a tent just so that if the weather was bad, I didn't have to rush stuff inside. Um, I don't have to put the sides on the tent. We talked about this last month. It's 10 by 10. There's still 30 feet of frontage to the road. And just looking to try to get through COVID and just try to get people to feel comfortable to shop. It's been really slow. I'm hoping that if things are outside, people will feel more comfortable. It's not gonna be a lot of stuff. It's probably gonna just end up being like a sale table. But I'd like to be able to have the option to use it, have a table or two under that 10 foot tent. Um, Matt? Yes, Alice. Uh, this is Alice. Um, where did we leave off on the condition that this parallel or this uh, work in hand in hand with the state regulations and the uh, how we define uh, this being a special favor during COVID? Where do we leave off on that? Um, so we, we recognize at the last meeting that the, the executive orders would probably expire sometime mid spring. Right. Um, and the applicant, um, made the, the, the argument that, um, it would nice to have some continuity through yeah. the summer months. So I think that that's the first thing that we should discuss because as we right. know, as we've heard, right. Um, the executive orders are going to be lifted, um, in, in uh, April, for the April most 19. part, right? By the end of this month? April yeah. 19. Yeah. April okay. 19th is, is the date that's on the executive orders now. Right. Um, there's no way to know whether that's, I mean, that, that looks like a, that's look, looks like what's probably going to happen. Um, from the applicant's perspective, it's, it's, it's probably not as, uh, as precise as she would like it. Um, so her request is that we, is that we relax the rules for the summer, the summer season, whatever that is. Does that end on, on Labor Day? Does that end mid October? You know, what's what's the what what is the pleasure of the commission? So I think there's I think Alice is right. There's 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 three maybe three questions. The first one is how does this tie into the executive orders and should it? Um, the second is um, how do we make this happen within the regulations and the proposal is that we ease um, section 4131.4 which allows for um, hold on I'm just on the wrong page 41 4131.4 which is permitted by right um, uh, accessory display of merchandise or goods outside of a retail establishment, art gallery, or personal service establishment during the hours such businesses business is open, provided that, one, the display is located immediately adjacent to the building. Two, um, that the display does not exceed, extend more than three feet from the building. And three, the display does not interfere with pedestrian or vehicular circulation or emergency access. So the proposal is that we relax this to some distance greater than three feet um, for which is the 4130 4131.4 B um, and that we we make it contingent upon a special permit so so each each business in town would have to come before us if they wanted to do something outside of those three feet um, so that was only two so I think that's all I've got well, you wouldn't make it a special permit. My recommendation would be that it would just be site plan approval because it's commercial. I, I don't think you're going to get really anybody else that's going to be able to come out any farther, maybe maybe with the exception of foreign cargo, um, you know, closer to, the, to that. They're the only ones that have a bigger front yard or, or as big a front yard as Gina currently does right now. So I think the question is, can we allow her to put up two tables five feet from the end of, of, her, of her current front porch? She so already has be... the ability as of right to put items out for display. 
-hmm. It's really what you're looking at only is can can we can we kind of um, loosen up the you know the three feet and make it make it five. You don't need to put down when or how long this needs to happen unless you you want to. Um, you know, I mean, I I think I think we have to to give the merchants at least a, a benefit of the doubt that they're not going to take advantage of something when, when it would be more beneficial for them to actually get people inside the building where there are more product. Um, so I would just I would just say that it would be okay to loosen up, you know, the th change the three feet to five. And why five, not six? Well, you can go six. I was using five because it's, you know, five, 10, 15, 20. It's just an easier number to choose. But well, yeah, if, that, if it's that random, then this thing is going to get out of control. Well, no, but each person that wanted to come in and, and say, you know, let's just say that foreign cargo wants to say, you know what, I would like to be able to move mine out a little bit as well, because Gene is doing it. They would have to come in and, and they would have to do the same thing that Gina did. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm asking for, like the tent that I already own is 10 by 10. So if it was flush against the building, then I'm asking for an additional seven feet, right? If I'm allowed three. That have like a buff, maybe a two foot buffer from the porch, then I'm asking for 12 feet. So it seems like the question is is one, if we do we want to ease the regulation and just ease it permanently? Is it is it is there a drawback to allowing those those vendors, those stores that have the the property in front of their stores, which there's not too many, there's only two or three, um, to be able to use that a little bit more and put a put a a table five feet out in front of their porch or six feet out in front of their porch um, or not. I mean, I, I, think, I think that's the question. And then, and then if we don't want to do it permanently, then do we want to do it temporarily? So do you, are you, Adam, are you suggesting that um, 4131.4 point and the B be actually removed from the regulation so that it, it doesn't become, it's not an issue? I have to find it because that 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 um, forty one thirty one point four B says the display does not extend more than three feet from the building. That's where that three <laughs> feet from the building thing comes in. Why don't we just say the tent is not part of the display, and if they want to put up a tent for potentially inclement weather, let them put up a tent. Right. Not I don't regulate. Take it down, and then we don't have to do anything except just say don't don't abuse the privilege or we'll have to sick our zoning enforcement officer on you when she's done with the private burial grounds <laughs> alice you don't you don't seem to be in agreement with any of this well i've used the term slippery slope once tonight <laughs> and i might as well use it again uh i just am what you do for one, you got to do for all. And, um, you know, I think I haven't measured it, but if you go down that side of Main Street, there are other buildings, establishments that have a yard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are about five of them, right? <laughs> yeah. So ones that ones whole side of Main Street is going to end up being tents all up and down Main Street. Is there a permit? Just saying, for, that's a, I'm just saying that's a possibility. Is there a and, permit for the villager to have a tent for the restaurant and for the book sale and for all of those things? The villager's tent um, actually is only allowed up because of COVID so that right. they, could, they could provide outdoor seating. Um, right. And there's, there's no tent for the book sale. Usually the book sale is just the books with the covered canvas things on them. Um, and they don't usually have a tent, but the tent that's there was just really for COVID. Right. Um, and what I'm trying to say is, I don't know if you could understand for a second what it feels like to be a storefront during COVID, but it's not fun. 
and we've been paying rent for periods of time that we weren't allowed to be open. <laughs> and I don't want to make it a pity party, but I'm just asking to try to survive the climate. And it's a 10 by 10 tent and a table. That's yeah. Only to be out on weekends. My recommendation is to not even bother with the tent. And my recommendation would be to put one table on each side of the walkway as close to the front building as you can. And if you need a tent because it's raining or it's exceptionally sunny out, why anybody would want to be under a tent when it's exceptionally sunny, but then you could put the tent over it if you need it. Right, I agree with that. It's just the sun fading the items. That's the main concern really. All right. So, so well, I'd just, like just, it to be so said that we all are we all know how desperately bad COVID has meant for all kinds of businesses. Period. And that is not because we aren't sensitive, but I am very sensitive as a commissioner for the town of being lax in regulating the things that go on in our town as we're supposed to. That's all I'm saying. I mean, that's what my job is here. And <laughs> right, and my job is to try to pay my bill and stay here in the life of my lease. So I'm just asking for permission for the one season to be able to try to accommodate people's different views on COVID and want not, not everyone wants to come inside. I think that my recommendation would be that this is tied directly with some kind of state regulation with respect to uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, procedures. Can we, uh, is it I'll, possible for us to, to, to write this as a temporary measure that ends after such and such a date, whatever that is, uh, August 30th or whatever it is that this commission decides to do, but, but Donna and Matt, is it, is it possible for us to write a temporary um, regulation? Because I, I didn't know that we could. Yeah, there's no such thing as a temporary regulation. <laughs> well, that's you know, what what I what I can do. I mean, and and honestly, this does not even need a permit if she stays Wait. within the three feet. Exactly. Hold on. Wait. We we have allowed the canned coffee and chocolate to go absolutely against our regulations. Right. And we did that on a temporary basis. So to say now that we can't do that, that we shouldn't be doing that, right. is it, it's it, I, I I can't I can't abide that. Um, I'm also, I'm going to say, hold on, hold on. That's that the the tent at the villager. Was specifically was was specifically allowed by a uh, an executive order. So it's not that we're allowing that. They they right. told us that. So so uh, yeah. Which and I, I agree with Alice. That's you know my business is has been absolutely and terribly impacted by the COVID. So it, please don't tell me. Please <laughs> don't tell me. Um, now I'm 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 happy to. I'm, I'm happy to make some concessions, and I, I actually would rec I, I, I would recommend to the commission that we that we do something by a certain date because that gives everybody in town, all the all the merchants in town, the ability to plan for the summer seasons. I don't think it's fair to tie it to April twentieth or whatever it is that 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 the executive order is going to expire. I think that if we're going to do this in the spirit of how we've treated. Kent Coffee and Chocolate and everybody, I think, fairly in town is that, that that we can do it and we should do it. And it's just a question of temporary, which I think we should. I don't think we should change the regulation. And if it, and if it works out, that's that 10 feet or 12 feet off of the building is fine for this summer, then we consider consider changing our regulations. So, so Matt, could, Matt, could we just to... <laughs> tie it to something if the state regulation says april 20th could we say um through two months post the 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 state regulations i, I think we could alice if we said if it's you know two months is probably not long enough so I well I'm, i just to, made that i made that June, july august September, maybe it's maybe five months well why months. don't why don't you do it through the sidewalk sales 
through the end of the sidewalk sale. Because the day of the side, the weekend of sidewalk sales, everybody's going to have a tent up. And then, you know what, then that's it. And everybody has their tents up and they do what they're doing. And then they come down and that's the end of it. And we're finished. When and is what the if it, what, what if they decide the sidewalk sales are in September? Well, then you, then you would go through, through the sidewalk sale in September. That makes sense. Okay. When, when is it normally? Kind of the sidewalk sale? Normally, the beginning of August, I believe, the first week. The, the second weekend in August, usually? It's the second August. weekend in August. Or I think it has to be at least through September. I'm sorry, David, go ahead. That's right. I, just, I feel like we could just say at this point if a business has outdoor display and they want to have a tent, a 10 by up to a 10 by 10 tent, one per business, they're welcome to do it until the sidewalk sale or Labor Day, whichever comes first. But we've, just, I'm not sure we're gonna get any further at this point. But let them have a tent and let's be done with COVID. Yeah. I, think, I yeah. think we should just pick a date. I don't think that the sidewalk sale- And do Labor Day. Anything. If they decide to move this sidewalk sale to mid July, I don't see why we would take the, that ability away from them. Let's let the vendors be able to do that if they apply for it through the summer the summer season ends that's when our tourists are here give them a chance to yeah. end it on labor day so you don't see any need to tie it to the state's protocol relative to covid no because we don't control that 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 can change oh, no. <laughs> it can happen and so i think we i think it's really clean and there's also some expense for for the business owners who are going to do this for something to all of a sudden change that they have no 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 ability to do anything about so i don't see why we just don't choose a date and let them do it through the summer and you know that's when people and when come. they come back next year and want the same thing are you going to give it to them again next summer well, Only hopefully there's no COVID, covid and then they don't have to have it or maybe well, we'll see we'll that's my it. point the, but Alice, there in adam you just you just said my point it's got to be tied to something not just because the sun's out yeah you can't tie it to the april because they're talking right now that legislation is not going to allow the executive orders to be extended past then and the whole idea that gina came forward with was that it's going to end up being past the end of the executive orders he's already starting to open up restaurants and so it, it's actually as a courtesy to the customers who don't want to come in to, that even though the executive orders are done, the stores are open 100 percent, you're going to still have people who are going to be uncomfortable going into close quarters. So I don't think that you can tie it to the executive orders. I think tying it to Labor Day um, would be good. And if we want to make it a more permanent thing, then they, we can have an argument over a permanent regulation change over the winter. But this is like a one-time pass. It ends Labor Day. And that's it. Can I just understand about the property itself? Was it just somewhere along the way it was deemed that that yard was not to be used? I don't understand when that... Was that just something that... It's been like that for a long time or... It's not to your property park. only. It's it's a regulation for it's all of the properties. It's for all the town. It's it's for everything in the village center commercial district. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So I I I I don't like to make motions um, myself, but I'm going to make an exception this time. Um, so I would make a motion um, that we, because of the pandemic, um, and in light of the. Um, because because of the pandemic um, and to make it easier on vendors in the town of Kent, um, we will relax um, item 41314B to um, state 15 feet from the building um, until the so until Labor Day, um, with the approval with uh, um, a zoning permit. I'll second that. 
Can you amend it? Okay, for that Day gives you know, Say it again. Labor Day 2021. Yeah. Okay. Labor Day 2021. <laughs> I, I accept that uh, the modification. Well, I think that's a, a, a very legitimate thing to, to say, David, because I was just going to ask you what happens next year and the year after that. And we do this every year. We have to open it to Labor Day or is it Not Labor Day normal. forever? No, well, Labor Day 2021. The, we sure hope the motion that, that was made oh, specifically said it was because of, of what was going on for COVID. So this doesn't unless we still have a pandemic next year, this is not a factor for next year. And if vendors wanna put an application to, to change a regulation, then we can make that, then we'll take that up at that time. But this, this, the motion was specifically for right now and specifically because of COVID. And David's modification and Alice's comments are, 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 are absolutely valid. Um, so Labor Day 2021, and I'm looking for a second. I did, I seconded it. Oh, great, could, great. Could, you, could we be sure? I do not think, Adam, that Matt's proposal recommendation said exactly what you said. Oh, I thought he, I thought at the beginning no, he said- No, he did not say that. Because of the COVID, right? He, right. Yeah, he I thought you said because that. of the COVID. That's what yeah, you began did. the motion, right? You, Don, what, what, do you, what do you got, Donna, for the motion? Did you together? Ty any, has the motion, but I, I mean, I have bits and pieces. Because of the pandemic. Because of the pandemic. Okay. Right. Okay. You, you didn't say COVID, but you said pandemic. Yep. Because that's what of, I have. So, so you want to modify that to, to because of the to the current COVID pandemic? Yeah, let's I, make I it. Don't don't make it pandemic it is. <laughs> it's the it's the other pandemic in twenty twenty one. <laughs> All right, so it's a, it's a, it's it's a motion and a second, and um, we've had some discussion, um, and I will call the vote. Okay, so all those in favor, so signify by raising your hand, saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay, great. Motion carries. Thank Alice, you. Alice, did you abstain? Yes. Okay. I appreciate you working with me till Labor Day. Much appreciated. All right, so what I'll do, Gene, is um, I'll shoot you off the zoning permit that you'll need to fill out and then just fill it out and bring it back in. You know, you can you can drop it in the box at the front um, at the front of town hall. Okay. And that'll, that won't happen till Monday. No so. problem. Okay. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck, Gina. Thank you. All right, um, so moving on to 6B6 which is the um, approval of the five-year capital plan. And this was a letter that we got, <clears throat> 6B6 capital plan. Um, hold on, hold please. There it is. So um, this is the capital plan memo that we got from, uh, from the Board of Finance. Um, and they're asking us to simply approve the projects within the purview of the planning and zoning and not the costs associated with them. So what I can see from the capital proposal, um, on the first page near the bottom, right under total buildings, zoning regulations in the year 2022, there's $50,000. So we're not, we're not looking at the $50,000, but we're looking at the zoning regs. And there's nothing else here, Don, if I'm reading this right, there's nothing else here that's within our purview as, as land use. Um, there, there isn't because the town of Kent is exempt from zoning, but under normal circumstances, you would be looking at the rebuild of the roads and does that fall within the plan of conservation and development? Is that something that the town has expressed concern over with regard to the rebuild of the road, making sure that the roadways are safe um, for traffic and for, you know, so that's what she's looking for is stuff that's tied to the plan of conservation and development. So that's, those are the things that you would be looking at. So the repairs of the bridges, 
the repair of Botsford Road. It has to do with the, um, the desire of the town to maintain safe and travelable, that's a word, um, roadways. Yeah, and I, 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 I think that's a load of hooey. I, I, I don't, I don't think that that this, I, I don't think that this commission. That's that's what it is. So if the, if the commission felt that that you know that what they're doing to the roadways doesn't fall in line with the plan of conservation and development, then you have you've got the requirement to to speak up and say I don't agree with that. So the that's it. or or you would speak up and say, you know what, I, I agree with maybe Bostard and Spooner, but you know what, I want to add Fuller Mountain there. I think that's another road that needs to be added. So that's what you're looking at. I don't think our POCD calls out anything regarding repairs to any specific roads. It doesn't say specific roads, but it does say that you need to make sure that the roadways within the town are safe to be traveled upon. Sure. And that bridges are strong enough to carry the traffic that goes across them. It's a statutory requirement. I do want to point out to you that this capital plan has not been approved by the Board of Finance. So as we did last year, the motion that was made was I move to approve the Town of Kent five-year capital plan dated 2-10-21 with the understanding that any additions or dollar increases be resubmitted for reapproval. I mean, if we're supposed to actually approve these road repairs and bridge repairs, which, which are significant sums of money, and I'm sure that they're legitimate sums i feel like rick or somebody should come to tell us what this stuff is i mean we're we can look at it on 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 this spreadsheet but we don't really know what this is so how as a commission are we supposed to approve you know a million dollars worth of taxpayer money when nobody's even come to say look this road needs this stuff because it's not working well and this bridge is about to fall in so we have to do this and this is how we have to fix it and that's why it costs three hundred and fifty thousand dollars and i mean am i wrong about that so all right donna could you say could you could you tell me what our resolution was last last year at this time the resolution and that you made last year was to approve what's presented but that if the Board of Finance changes it again, because they have not approved this, that it comes back again for another reapproval. Okay. Nancy, and, Nancy and I have gone through this. We did, we did it at the very beginning. We had an issue, Nancy and I. And then when Mark Sabetic was there, he said, you're right. You're supposed to approve what the Board of Finance has approved already. Nancy is not of the same belief. So now we're, Nancy is now the chairman. So now we're back to the, you know what, if we're going to approve the capital plan, this is not the final version. It could be changed again. So therefore, if they're going to up the capital plan, my recommendation is that they come back to the plan of to planning and zoning. If they decrease it, it doesn't make any difference. And I, I, I absolutely agree with all of that. So the motion we made last year, or the, or the, or the, 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 the response back to um, the Board of Finance last year sounds reasonable to me. I still am, I, I still object to the fact that roads and bridges fall under our purview because there's, there's, there's text in the POCD. Well, there's um, also section 8-24. So anytime, so like these plans are, the money is in there, but when Rick, gets ready to actually do this work, he's going to come to the commission for an 824 approval, which is the municipal improvements that they do on the roads and, and the where, bridges. 824, what, what eight is that? 8-24 eight eight is municipal of what? improvements. I'm sorry? Oh, of the, of the budget. No, it's a state statute. Okay. okay. So state statute says that any time a town is going to make municipal improvement, municipal improvements, um, extend a road, abandon a road, 
uh, purchase property. So when they purchased the property to build the visitor center, they had to come for an 824 approval. Um, uh, airport, something to do with an airport, which doesn't apply to us because we don't have any airports. Um, and, um, and, and then it's town improvements to the roadways. They are required by eight, statute 824 to come before the Planning and Zoning Commission. So this is just giving you an idea that they're gonna be coming to us. This is the money that they're gonna be spending on it. So that's why you are, you're kind of pre-approving the 824 requirement for municipal improvements. Yeah, and I'm uncomfortable doing that. I mean, that, that, that's, that's just me. I mean, I'm, I'm reading, I'm, right now, so without the 824, I'm reading the POCD and the POCD says that the town shall and the, and the KT, KDPW shall or should and the town should and, and nowhere does it say, I mean, it does say that the wherever possible and appropriate, the Planning and Zoning Commission should require that new roads connect existing roads or private or, or provide two routes of access, sure, but that's 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 not maintenance of existing roads. I'm just uncomfortable with somebody telling me that it's my purview to approve the budget for something that it's that that I have nothing to say about. So I'm happy I'm, I'm happy to approve the planning and zoning budget. I'm, I'm and I'm happy to to make the motion. I'm happy that that's that that's we approve a motion tonight that that is in line with last night with last year. But I'm, 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 I, I'm, I want to go on record that I'm, that I'm not approving expenditures for roads. And I could be way off base now, and maybe, maybe, maybe the, the attorney Ziska has to tell me that I'm wrong. But for tonight, um, if they're asking me to approve this budget for the roads, I'm not, I'm not, I'm nowhere near in a position to do that. Okay. I, I mean, I don't know. I've never, I've never had anybody not do that. So. Um, yeah, like I say, we can make the same motion we made last year. That's fine with me because it's my interpretation that we're all making that we as a commission are making that are making that assertion for the planning and zoning budget, but not for roads, not for the board of selectmen, not for the the board of ed, not for, you know, because we talk about the board of education, we talk about education and the plan of conservation and development. We talk about conservation and the plan of conservation and development. Right, but that's not a municipal improvement. Yeah, I'm not buying it, Donna. Okay. But that's okay. just me. I, you know, I will that's, send that's you um, tomorrow the 824 state statute so that you can understand um, what that is and what you'll be looking at, at the, in the capital plan. <clears throat> I have a question. If if the statute says that we're supposed to do that, I totally understand what Matt is saying. And I don't disagree. I, I go back to that. If we're supposed to approve capital improvements on town's roads, on town's buildings, then shouldn't somebody from the town come before us and at least give us some information? Because right now we're being asked to approve something that we have no idea about. I don't know, I don't even know what they're doing, what they wanna do at Botsford Road. What is the, the improvement? Are they just, are they putting in new drains? Yes. Are they Okay, but I, I don't know that I don't see that. Are they repaving the whole road? Are they putting in new curbs? I have no idea. I think that somebody from the town, like in this case, it would be Rick, but should come before us and when they ask us to approve replacing boilers or or they wouldn't come before you for that because it's not it's not a municipal improvement under 824 okay well here it is the municipal improvements are they still the point is that they should come before us and i don't know what the municipal improvements are donna and that's the that's the point okay, they should so come before us before we have to approve something because I don't know what they want us to approve. Okay. 824 says municipal improvements. No municipal agency or legislative body shall, one, locate, accept, abandon, widen, narrow, or extend any street, bridge, parkway, or other public way. Two, locate, relocate, substantially improve, acquire land for, abandon, sell, or lease any airport, park, 
playground, school, or other municipally owned property or public building. Three, locate or extend any public housing, development, redevelopment, or urban renewal project. Or four, locate or extend public utilities and terminals for water, sewage, light, power, transit, and other purposes until the proposal to take such action has been referred to the commission for a report. Notwithstanding the provisions of this section, a municipality may take final action approving an appropriation for any proposal prior to the approval of the proposal by the commission pursuant to this section. So what they're doing is they're asking you for prior approval to 824 based on municipal improvements. So that's all of the road work, the bridge work, and the parking rec stuff. Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 that's all great, but I, I have not done personally a, a, a survey of the town, of the roads, of the status of the roads, of the bridges, of the culverts, of, of any of those things. So without, without that information, without a complete survey, presented by somebody who knows what they're doing, like Adam is saying, then I'm, I'm in the dark. So then what happens is when Rick comes and gets, when his, that one particular job is funded after the five years or 10 sometimes, and there's money in the budget for him to do that work, they come to the Planning and Zoning Commission at that point in time with their site plans, with their maps, with their projected changes to the roads and with all their site plans. But I'm perfectly happy to do that. I'm perfectly happy to approve that in a, in a reasonable and deliberative manner. Right, and that's when they come happen. in front of me, but I'm not willing to do that here in an unreasonable and not deliberative manner. But you're not approving the actual work. Only thing that you're approving in this process is the funding of the work that needs to be done. If you, the Planning and Zoning Commission, when they when when Rick comes before you, the Planning and Zoning Commission feels that you're, you know what, Rick, it's a great job, but you're only going halfway. We need you to go the other way. Then that gets kicked back and additional funding needs to be provided. But we can't if we're pre-approving it. You're pre-approving a certain amount of money, but if you feel when they come forward with the actual application, that not enough money has been funded to do what's being done because more work needs to be done. And it's at that, that point in time when they come to you with the 824 that you deny it or approve it. So this is okay. approving. Um, this I, is, I, I, do I just not remember? I, I feel like we're talking around in circles. I feel like you're not understanding my objection. Donna, do you, in, all, so, in, in, the, in the years I've been on this commission, I'm just trying to remember, I know Rick has come before us once or twice for for things, but I don't ever really remember um, somebody coming before us before they were going to do a bunch of road work or anything else. No, they never came before you to do road work during the capital planning process, but they came before you to do the work. So there's no work in the in the 10, 12, 15 years I've been on this commission. No, no work has been done like that on the in the town. No, they've come thing before is, you. I don't remember anybody coming before us. Like you're telling us that that you're asking us to approve funding so that they can start to put money away for something that's going to happen in the future. Right, and in the right. future, when they're ready to do it, they're going to come back before us and discuss it with us. And at that point, if there's not enough money there, they'll have to go back and ask for more. I'm just saying that in all these years, I can't remember that ever happening. I'll have to Unless pull the 824 file then. Because I know that we've had 824 approvals. I know we have. Well, we certainly looked at the culvert on, on Carter, right? We looked at, yeah, we looked we at the bridge on Carter. That. That's an 824 approval. Um, the purchase of the property to build the visitor center was an 824 application. But this is the first time, Donna, in my, this is the 11th time I'm going through this process, right? Mm-hmm. So the maybe it's the twelfth time that I've never I, I, I've never been asked or it's never been made clear to me that that we are approving the the the, the roads and bridges or the Swift House or the town garage or the senior center or the community house or 
you know, all of those things. I mean, which, what, what you're saying is that almost every single thing on this list, you know, highway trucks, is that us? No, no, it's municipal improvements. It's, it's town owned property improvements, the roads, it's the, like I said, it's the roads, it's the purchase of the land, it's extension of the roads. So you're just saying, right. I, I, you're not approving the actual work because that hasn't come before you yet. You're just saying, we're anticipating this coming forward. Right, but you started off by saying, well, maybe we wanna add something to this. So I, I look at this and you know, right off the top of my head, I would say, why, don't, why isn't Carter Road on here? Why aren't we repairing Carter Road next year? You're gonna ask. But I, I, it's not my job to ask. I mean, I, 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 and I, I understand that, 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 that you believe that it's my job. I do. Um, but I, 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 it comes as a shock to me. And if, if it truly is my job, then I'm not in a position, I'm, I'm not prepared to approve this. And I'll, I'll, I'll need some further information. I'll, I'll, need, I'll need somebody to tell me what's, what, what the reason for all of these improvements are and, and how they came up with it. And I don't, I don't need to know what the budget is because that's not what's, what's um, what's being asked of us, right? It's just the projects. And so right. how, how, how did all of these come, how did all of these things come to, to come to pass? Why, why are they on this list? And why aren't, you know, why isn't burying the, the electrical service down through Main Street on this list? So why is, can we have Rick come before us and say, look, these are the things that, that we're looking to do, you know, in five years from now and eight years from now and 10 years from now, these are the things that, that, that we see as problems or, or repairs that are necessary. Um, so at least everybody on the commission has some, some idea of, of what they're asking for us here. And, and maybe then we would know why this road or that road isn't included in it and why burying electric isn't included in it because maybe that's just the following year, but we're not being asked about that right now and we can't see that right now. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll tell the commission that um, the board of finance that you did not approve it, they'll have to approve it. They'll probably approve it at their March meeting and then you'll be approving in April the approved capital plan by the board of finance. But, Which is the way but, it's always supposed to be anyway, so. But we're not gonna approve it if somebody doesn't come and explain right. to us. Well, I'll, have, I'll, I'll ask that Rick come forward. Okay, thank you. So Donna, also would you, uh, as, as you said you would, would you, would you send um, section 824? Yes. And then, um, yeah, so let's, let, let's, let's look at 824. Okay. And then I might ask you to, after I look at it, I might ask you to, to um, ask Attorney Ziska to, to tell me what it is that I need to do. I, and okay. when, I, when I mean I, I mean the commission. You got it. Great. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So I just need a motion to table this to the next meeting. I make that motion. Table it to the next. Second it. Great. Thank you both. Um, and then moving on to uh, 6B7, which is the temporary operation of a farmer's market from May 21, 2021 to the end of October 29, 2021. Fridays only, 0 South Main Street, map 19, block 12, lot 6. Um, same locations, looks to be the same layout as, uh, as we've approved in previous years. Yes. Um, and actually the dates, I think last year they were, they were there a little bit longer. So they seem to be cutting back on this. They were mid from May 22nd to mid October. Oh, now they're going longer through the end of October this time. May 21st, these are Fridays. May 22nd. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. May 21st, Fridays only from three to 6 p.m. 
Yeah, it seems to be really, or at least in, in years past, it's been really low impact. Um, so I would look for a motion to uh, to approve um, 6B7. Okay, I'll make that motion. We approve 6B7. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, so signify by raising your hand or saying aye. Aye. Motion carries. Great. Okay. Um, hey, Wes, can I uh, turn this over to you? Since I don't have eyes here, could, could I ask someone else to do it? Um, I guess that, that that would be fine, Wes. I think uh, you know you were my you were the second choice as the vice chair, um, but uh, I I think um, in the absence of our secretary and treasurer, I could ask Adam or Daryl to jump in and um, act as chair for the six B eight. I nominate Adam. Second, approved. <laughs> Um, you're on mute there, monkey. Do I need to read something in? Is there something? Uh... Um, no, this it's uh, it's the application. It's the application under six B eight. So if you would uh, um, read in that with the six B eight, and then uh, and then lead the discussion and and um, to whatever conclusion you come to, um, and then I'll jump back on. Just because I, 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 I want to recuse myself from this discussion. Sure. Okay. Um, I will uh, stand by. Thanks. I'm just trying to find the uh, agenda one second. Okay. So this is for application 21 21 C Guy Mori. For engine 22 LLC, 21 Bridge Street, change of use from car sales, repair, apartment, retail and contractor's office to car sales, repair, apartments to retail and contractor's office. And I assume that means that um, this, uh, the change is that there would be two apartments, but uh, um, Donna, can you uh, tell us more yes. about the application? Yep, that, that's the case. Um, currently, um, the second floor of the building um, of 21 Bridge Street has one legal apartment. Um, I know Mr. Mowry is going to come forward and say that historically it's been two. I've talked to um, Stan McMillan, who's been the fire marshal forever. Um, they went back, I went back through the files and um, everything that I have indicated, there was only ever one apartment in there. Tax assessor feels the same way. There is only has only ever been one apartment in there. Um, so really, basically, all this is is just a change of use to allow him to create a legal second apartment on the second floor of 21 Bridge Street under Section um, 4123.11. Which is mixed residential and commercial use within the same building. Okay. Um, should we hear from Guy? Guy, do you want to? Uh, yeah. Um, is it, can you can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, I don't. I don't. I'm not trying to prove whether it was pre-existing or not. I can just tell that it was. Um, but it doesn't matter if it's not on record, then we're just gonna go from a one, a, a one pre-existing to two, but we don't have to install any partitions. The bathroom is in place. The bedroom is in place. It's all there. And the baseboard is the telling factor and the framing is of course too, but the baseboard has gotta be from the 1940s. In every room it's there, um, but it doesn't matter. You know, I guess uh, we just wanna make it a legal apartment, that's all. And it requires no no interior partition framing because it's all already existing. So really, you don't 
have to make any changes is what you're saying. It, That's correct. Everything is there. It's just not, it, it's, it's not. It's just not recognized. It's not recognized by the town as a second apartment. Correct. No, he'll have to, he'll have to follow building and fire marshal code sure, because sure. it is a, um, a commercial building. So I don't know if the building's going to need to be sprinkled or not. That's, that is not my concern. That'll be left up to both um, Joe Manley, the building official, and uh, Stan, the fire marshal. So right now for us, it's just a matter of, of doing the change of use to make the two apartments. It has been, and it has been in this um, file for a long time that any other changes that were going to be made to this building, a site plan was going to need to be submitted. Um, he did submit one that was created by Gary, um, Gary Hawk for a, um, an easement, but there's no parking spaces or anything shown on here. And I don't know if the commission wants to have the parking spaces identified or not. So that would be up to you guys. So there is a site plan, but there's no parking that's shown for it. How and, much parking does it need in it with the new configuration? Uh, hold on one second and let me see if I can find development park. Is all the parking commingled though, aside from the actual number? Obviously there's a vast amount of parking around those buildings. So uh, for, for, um, for dwellings, it's um, for multifamily dwellings, it's 2.5 spaces um, per dwelling unit. So they would need five spaces that would be dedicated to the apartments. They, they would need five spaces for in total for both apartments, basically two and a half spaces per apartment. Right. And then for the other uses, do they have requirements as well? Yeah. <clears throat> Automotive uses is one space per 400 square feet of gross floor area for sales and one space per 100 square feet of retail space um, for motor vehicle fueling stations, automotive and repair and service facilities is two spaces per service bay. And I think there's six service bays in there. So he would need 12 for those um, plus the two, so, uh, that, so another five, so that's 17. And then um, the sale would be one space per 400 square feet of gross floor area. I don't know what the commission thinks and Guy, I don't, I don't know if you can do this. I, I think it's hard for, for the commission to approve this without, I know that there's enough parking, but we need to see kind of, we need to see some layout of, of that shows that there's the number of parking spaces needed for all the different uses in the in the building, and that's something that we ask, and we do ask like every single applicant. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Yeah. No. No. I I can easily do that. There's vast spark parking there uh, yeah. in the front, in the back, in the side. So uh, if you guys want me to actually draw the lines in, uh, I, it's something I can do. Donna, would that be, is that, is that sufficient if, if Guy takes a plan and draws in, draws in the lines to, to show the amount of parking that he has and that he has sufficient parking for? Yeah, um, I mean, I'll have to do with the scale just to make sure that we know. And then I don't know what the use is of the three bay garage in the back. I know originally that area was leased out to uh, a contractor, but I don't know if they're still there or not. If they are, then parking would need to be um, configured for them as well. Right. So, so I will assume again two, two cars per bay down there, similar to the requirement for the garage uh, upstairs on on the upper level. Well, it all depends what you're doing down there. So it's a landscaper, you know. Okay. So then that's not auto automotive repair. You would need to do that on on. 
Developing and constructing public warehousing. Um, building construction or landscape contractors is one space for 1,000 square feet of gross floor area. Well, okay, that's, uh, wow, that's very little parking that he requires. Um, so it's no problem. So one space per 1,000 square feet. Yeah, you can find it on page 126 and 127 of the regulations. Okay, it seems easy. So, so uh, I, can, I can take care of that. And if you guys will allow me to do it on one of these existing plans uh, in the packet that I submitted, um, the catalyst plan would be the clearest plan to do it because it shows the entire parking lot. And there's not a lot of other stuff on that plan already. I don't know if you guys have that in front of you. It's uh, figure 4B. And that is the second to the last page of the packet. Is that the one that... Uh... Oh, no, I can't see that one. Oh, you're talking about the Catalyst Environmental Consultant? No, I think you're better off using the one that Gary did for um, Mrs. Um, Gustafson. Okay, let me see that one. And you have that in your packet? Yep. The okay, big the scale good. site plan, right? Or this, the big one? Yeah, the big one. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, I can do that. It's a little busy, that plans, but I can do it. I mean, as long as I can... Um, superimpose the spaces on the existing notes on that that plan and it's no problem at all i i think that's i think that would be fine okay. donna does guy have to um show specific pl spaces for for each business and use an apartment or if if the property needs 17 spaces and he shows that there's 17 or more spaces is that sufficient it doesn't have to be designated these spaces for this business no i don't want to i don't want to tie him into saying that the apartment can only park you know like apartment one can only park here and apartment two has to go in the back and you know that, that's i'm not going to regulate that so i just need to know the number of parking spaces the sizes are are in the regulations of how you need to scale it out okay. um and show it on the on the plan yeah Okay, that I, 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 I was just going to make a recommendation since a local surveyor has prepared this map and he obviously has it in CAD, you know, you may want, it may be worth it to you to have Gary just do a parking analysis and he would show the best configuration for maximizing your parking and he would automatically obviously put it down to scale and then you and we would have a two scale map, um, which is a nice thing to have when there's, you know, fairly short distance to get there. Yeah, uh, that's the best way to do it. Uh -huh. Okay, so I can reach out to him and, and find out what that, hopefully it wouldn't, it would be an inexpensive thing. I'm always budget minded, you know, so, um, but I, I, you know, I will do that. You know, I'll reach out and find out if he can do that for us. I, it seems like he ought to be able to do it without too much trouble, without coming back out and measuring or anything, so. Um, and so who is this, who do you, you guys are recognizing what name on this map that did this? Gary Hawk, Bob Gary, Hawk. Bob Hawk, right? Yeah, yeah. so I, I see his signature, but I can barely make out his actual... Uh, he's, on, he's, he's on Maple Street Extension. Oh, he's right here in town. What's, how do you spell his last name? H-O-C-K. H-O-C-K, thanks. I just can't no, see here. You don't know I, Gary? Yeah, I don't know him. Oh, well, I'm going to. You are. They're right down uh, Maple Street Extension. Yeah, okay. right so that should be super easy then. Um, yeah, really easy. Okay, uh, so consider it done. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll do that and I'll resubmit it. Uh, you don't have to resubmit it. You just have to, so we'll, we'll table this to, to the next meeting. Um, He's going to have to resubmit it, yes. 
Well, he doesn't have to resubmit the application. He just has to resubmit the plan, right? Right. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Well, so we should have a discussion if if anybody has any questions. Let's find out now uh, regarding regarding having a second apartment. Um, I think it falls within the POCD that we want to have um, mixed use of commercial and residential spaces. And um, it seems like there's an apartment up there. Um, I don't know what anybody else thinks if anybody wants to have a make a comment. So I guess there's no more comments. So. Um, so Guy, if you can uh, make that plan, submit it to Donna, and if we could get a motion to uh, continue this to the next meeting. I'll move to table uh, 6B8 until the next meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Approved. Okay, thanks a lot. So well, we'll catch up to you the next time. So if if we are no longer in a COVID lockdown, is this something I can just submit or do I need to attend the next meeting? You're better off attending, Guy, just, um, just because if there's any questions that right, anybody has, we want to ask, but you know, it'll be old business, so it'll come up first. Okay, okay, very good. You won't have to wait till the end. Okay, okay, well, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Guy. Are we getting a Matt Winters back? He's sitting back there with a glass of wine, maybe. There okay. He is. okay. Who's that? All right. There he is. Hey, sorry, I was doing something else. <laughs> um, thank you, Adam. Thanks for uh, doing that on, on you know, which, uh, blind. <laughs> I sent an email to, uh, to, to Wes and Mark this afternoon, um, giving them the heads up that I would be recusing myself. Um, <coughs> and I, I, I should have sent it to everybody. Sorry. Thank you. It was an easy one. So thank you. And, uh, yeah, so it's, you can wrestle Daryl next time. <laughs> yeah, next time I, I I know I know to speak up quickly about who um who to endorse. No, <laughs> Adam was fun. Adam was very smooth. It actually was great. So I've never seen a motion pass so quickly. That was impressive. So does Adam want a job? No, <laughs> Is that I what everybody's saying. <laughs> I was talking about Daryl actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say, don't be jealous. There was applause. When, when everything passed. Uh, <laughs> you cut me to the quick there, Daryl. Um, okay, so uh, said agenda item number seven, um, the staff report, Donna or Ty, do you have anything that you wanna add except that we don't know what we're talking about with the, uh, with, with the general statutes? Uh, no, that's okay. I think that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could see Ty hold, biting your tongue the whole time. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so then uh, agenda item number 8A, it's a subdivision, subdivision regulation subcommittee. Um, we have discussed that already, so um, we'll, we'll move away and just keep it on the agenda for um, un until we're together. Um, and then other communication and correspondence, we've got the administrative permits and certificates of compliance. Does anybody have any comments? And then this, this letter addressed to somebody other than me uh, from the Federal Communications Commission information notice session, the 106 filings. Um, it, doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't say much, um, but just that the filing was made. What uh, is the second page? It says it's page one of two, but... Um... The second page was just um, the Connecticut Communication a commission on culture and tourism consultant contact information 
um, for the architectural historian, it was just that, you know, that was the other, they, they, they do a historic review of any kind of um, proposed cell tower locations. So I'm sure that the, ap the application was probably um, submitted to both of them. Homeland Tower is submitted to the Federal Communications and they have to submit to the um, Culture and Tourism as well. And does this letter mean anything? Does the filing mean anything? It doesn't... It's just it's putting you on notice that the application has been submitted. Okay. They couldn't even proofread it though. Yeah. Pretty... They're missing a verb. Are they? <laughs> <laughs> They're missing a lot of things. The new monopole and equipment compound will all for a future co-location of multiple providers. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so then uh, just moving on to agenda item number 10, right? Without any further discussion on, on the, the, the nine series. All good. So, then uh, this is the executive... Executive yeah, session I'm, I'm for the uh, litigation. I'm sorry, Wes, go ahead. I'm recusing myself from um, for any discussion of high watch. Okay, great. Then I would say, um, Wes, you're off the hook for the balance then, right? All right. Yes, yes indeed. <laughs> Good night, all. Take Good care. Night. Um, all right, so this is the pending litigation on high watch. Um, Donna, do we need to go into executive session? Nope, I don't have anything um, to tell you. Um, so then the agenda item number 11, which is the open session, I think the comment should be, um, should continue to be that uh, that's our position to follow the attorney's um, advice and um, recommendations for path forward. And if anything changes or if they need to report to us, then they, they, they should and will. Yes. Great. Okay. And then just before we adjourn, I, I, I see that uh, um, Trisha Worthington is listening and I just want to say hello, Trisha, and congratulations on your impending uh, graduation. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm here for a class assignment for my land use class. <laughs> oh, how boring is that? <laughs> <laughs> you poor thing. <laughs> So Trisha, if you if you if you come back to town, we got a spot for you on the commission. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I got a job in Providence, so I'll be. Oh, no. Well, it's maybe it's maybe you know after you sow your wild oats, you'll come back to us in your midlife. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So make that motion. Or somebody right, else. Great. Um, thanks, everybody. So that was, uh, I think that was productive. I think it was generally uh, efficient. And uh, we'll